we'd like to talk about how the Shaw family got to St. Tammany Parish. Uh, I had uh, started that way back in the early 1960s and going to the court, the clerk of court's office and doing interviews with people, I had a pretty good idea about the first Sharp who got here. His name was George Sharp. And George Sharp came down on a flatboat down the Mississippi River soon after the American Revolution. The Spanish closed New Orleans, the port of New Orleans, and people were streaming across the Allegheny Cumberland Gap going into Kentucky. There were two families that were prominent at that time it was the Daniel Boone and his brother, the Squire Boone, and the Bryans. The Bryans were a family that they all came down that road, military road, down from Pennsylvania down through Western Virginia. Uh, the Bryans uh, had several sons, four, five, six sons, and uh, but they were settled next to the Booms uh, in North Carolina, uh, Yadkin River, I forgot. But anyway, they as soon as the war was still going strong, a lot of people crossed the Cumberland Gap and got into Kentucky. Boone. <clears throat> uh, was a fascinated, a trader came through and was telling him about his trading practices in Kentucky and the land. So uh, Boone made a trip over there and then the Bryans made a trip over there. While the war was still going on, 1775 and so forth, back in Virginia, the Sharps who came down the trail, Western Virginia, and settled in, in Virginia there, were involved in the war. One was named James Sharps, and he became a scout for the Colonial Army. The British were sending an army of 1,200 men to penetrate the South Carolinas and to get into Georgia. Uh, but they didn't figure on a strong resistance. The colonials, the rebels and so forth, uh, got an army together of 1,700 men. Nine of on that army we found were sharps. Uh, that, and then I assume that the scout James Sharps was one of the names, but they didn't have the first names in it. Anyway, here the uh, Boones and the Bryans are busy in Kentucky. The Cherokees started hostilities and they were trying to survive. They had Bryan Station and Boonesboro and another station, only three stations survived. The rest of the early settlers had to get out. But anyway, back in Virginia, this army was formed and they, they um, met them, the British and the Loyalists, they met them at a place called, in western North Carolina called Kings Mountain. And they decisively defeated the army and sent them back going back. That was one of the big defeats of the British. In 1780, James Sharp, uh, the, uh, the, the hostilities were stopping at the time. Uh, in 1781, George Washington captured Cornwallis and his army, which stopped the hostilities. But James Sharp and his family migrated over the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky. And they settled at a place called Jackstown. Uh, Jackstown was about 18 miles north of Boonesboro. 
of uh, it was in the Lexington area later on. Anyway, uh, the war was over. The Spanish got West Florida and New Orleans uh, out of there because they were the allies with the uh, the colonials, and but they were worried about the Americans and the uh, the settlers coming across the Allegheny Mountains onto the Mississippi and into Spanish territory. So they were attempted a close. They put out a notice that they were going to close the Mississippi River. General J. Wilson comes into the picture. He was in Kentucky. He goes down the river in 1787, and he makes a deal with Esteban Miro, the Spanish commandant, to let the flatboats come through with their products and everything, and he would attempt to get those people to form a separate country and separate from the colonials. But anyway, he goes back and he tells the people in Kentucky the river's going to be open, you can take your tobacco products and your, and your farm products down the river and sell them in New Orleans and get shipped out. Uh, there was a man called John Haley and he bought a plantation near Boonesboro and I have the uh, his journal and he he was told by General Wilkerson that he could take his tobacco products and farm products down to New Orleans and sell them there that he would be welcome so he gets up four flatboats he builds in 1789, he starts down early spring when the water was high. Uh, the, the Kentucky River into Ohio or Mississippi. He gets down there and they dock on the levee. Uh, George Sharp was one of the uh, uh, 28 men that manned the four flatboats. They came in and landed about in June on the, but uh, in New Orleans on the levee, but the river, river. They looked for their surprise, and they had these tents all on the river, and all these people living there. To their surprise, they found out that six months before, they had a massive fire in 1788 that destroyed half of New Orleans. The people lost their homes and everything else. Well, Holly meets with Governor Miro, and he says, I'll sell you at the, at the regular price or even at what I paid, and we have food, hams, and, and we can help your people. Miro remembered that, and he was very well pleased. So pleased that after they finished, they sold the flatboats. The flatboats were broken up, the wood, people use it to build houses. They crossed the lake, 1789, to get to the King's Road to get up to Baton Rouge to pick up the Natchez Trace. They couldn't go back up the, the river. The river was eight miles an hour coming down current and it would be too difficult. So they were going back by pack horse. So here's George Sharp, one of the 28 men and of uh, John Holly's crew lands on the, on the uh, 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 river, the Chifuncta River or North Shore, and he buys, they buy a cups of horses from the Spells, the, the uh, British settlers that were still there, uh, the Smiths, the Spells, the Jeffrey Gaunt, and so forth, and they start back up the Natchez Trace. This was the first time that a shark that I know of set foot on the North Shore. It was such a successful trip that Holly, in his uh, journal, gets another, uh, uh, harvests tobacco and f food products again, and they go down on a second trip. This time, George Sharp was in charge of one of the flatboats, and one of his friends was an ex-loyalist who had to leave the colonies. He was from Edgecombe County. 
but he was a loyalist and he fought at, at uh, 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 South Carolina, uh, Charlotte, South Carolina, and he became a lieutenant. But loyalists were persa non grata after the war. So he went to Kentucky and he made friends with George Sharp. This was very important because this is the history of Mandeville and the Sharps in there. Anyway, they spent about 40 days coming down the river. And they come down again and they sell their products. And uh, the governor, Estevan Stephen Miro, remembers them, welcomes them. But George Sharp says, you know, we like the land across the lake we saw. We like to, to settle there to get a grant. Miro, who was getting promoted and going down to South America, says, we have a lot of rules, for, but I'm going to waiver all these rules that you have to live four years here. You have to uh, bring your kids up in Catholic. You have to go to the Catholic Church. I'm going to waiver all that, and I'm going to give you some abandoned Spanish, uh, British land grants. The, what he gave them then, I have a picture here. Later on, it was called the Castanu and Tobin map, the Castanguat grant after, so I'll get into that in a minute. But Esteban Miro says, I'm going to give you 640 acres, two or three British abandoned land grants. Okay, buy you Castan. Faircloth and, Joe, and John, uh, George Sharp settle on this land. It was by the trail going to Bayou Bacon. They put up their cabins. I don't know how they made their living, whether they trapped, traded with the Indians for uh, wood products or not. But anyway, uh, and they had other people living there at the time, the British people, Spells, the Edwards, the Jeffrey Gaunt, the Smith, were still living there. They were the only British settlers left on the North Shore. The others were abandoned during the uh, 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 Revolutionary War. But anyway, George Sharp was from Boonesboro back there, and after four or five years, he decides he wants to go back. But in the meantime, after he got down here, he called, he wrote his, uh, he would sent messages back to his brother, who were named Joseph, James, and Stephen, back at Boonesboro, and told them about the nice land. They get on the pack horses and start down uh, the trail. Stephen drops off when they hit the Tennessee border. He liked the land there, Duck River, and he, he settled there. S Joseph Sharp, and James Sharp, his younger brother, go down and they get near Natchez and they come to a place about 20 miles northwest of it. It was called Coles Creek. And they get a, uh, 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 Joseph Sharp gets a land grant at Coles Creek. Also, haven't been uh, t talked much about it, but there was the Richardson family. George and his three brothers who came from Carolinas and settled there in 1785. He had a daughter called Elizabeth. Joseph married Elizabeth Richardson, and that's going to uh, play an important part on the history of Mandeville. But anyway, uh, George Sharp sees his brothers. He gets back on the trail again, goes back to and. Uh, Boons, but he marries a Bryan girl, and this was 1798. The Indian Territory was opening up, it became Indiana, and a lot of people, even Squire Boone, was moving over. A lot of, a lot of the Bryans went to Hendricks County, uh, Indiana. But anyway, he got married, and this is where we leave George Sharp. Uh, he obviously had a family, but we haven't traced uh, any further back now. He was the first sharp in Mandeville. But while he was uh, in Natchez, he told his brother and the, his wife Richardson, whose father was George, he told them about the nice land on uh, the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain between Bayou Chinchub and Bayou Cane. 
Anyway, Richardson, George, gets his family together, and in 1797, when, when George left, he gets his family together. He had about eight kids, and he comes down uh, Lake Pontchartrain, and he settles on a van abandoned land of Rebecca Ambrose. Rebecca Ambrose was one of the early British settlers with her husband, Jacob. Jacob had a land grant on one, one of the bayous, and she had a land grant on Bayou Chinchuba. But anyway, when the Davises and the Webbs on the bayou uh, left to go up to uh, settle up in Je uh, Natchez, she went with them. And uh, so this land was abandoned about eight years. And here comes George Richardson. And he has a Martha and he has Nancy, daughters. Nancy marries uh, into uh, 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 a family there and Martha marries Zachariah Faircloth. What happened was Zachariah Faircloth bought out George Sharp for $40 at Bayou Castell. And he kept it, but in 1800, 1801, a hurricane came and drove him out. He went to live with the Richardsons on the lakefront. And he met Martha. Uh, he, uh, uh, George decides he wants to leave. He had three years enough and he wanted to go to Manchac. So he sells the land to Zachariah Faircloth for a cow and a calf. How do we know this? Nancy married Lawrence Sticker, S-T-I-C-K-E-R, who was in, living by Beatty Co., which is Beatty Co. now. He had a land grant there. But he said, I was in the room when that happened. Uh, they had a court trial, court case 225, and they wanted to know who was owning the land at the time. He said, Zachariah Fairpoth bought it from George Richardson. He was uh, married to his daughter, living with his daughter Martha. And he paid, he paid George a cow and a calf. He says, how do you know this? I was there. I was in the room. I heard it. I saw it. So anyway, uh, George Richardson leaves. But his, he leaves his daughter with Zachariah Fairpoth. Now, what has happened? Zachariah Faircloth mm -hmm. is now related to Joseph Sharp, who married Elizabeth Richardson. One married Martha Richardson, one married Elizabeth Richardson. Joseph Sharp uh, on Coles Creek, uh, the, the, the Spanish were getting very nervous. There were too many, it started the mass migration, and that they were pouring in from the uh, East Coast, the colonies. So they start making laws to make it very tough for anybody to add, uh, own land. They said, you have to live here five years. You have to be an adult. You have to put your kids in the Catholic Church. The Sharps, who were staunch Methodists, they were Scotch-Irish from Belfast, said, I had enough of this. They packed up. Uh, he, sold, he had an a agent, old H-O-L-T, uh, old that sold his land. And he went across the line into Louisiana, which is St. Helena Parish. He built a little log schoolhouse. And he had a couple of dozen kids in the schoolhouse. That's how he was making his living. Uh, teaching them to read or write, I don't know. Or maybe religion, I don't know. Anyway, one of the parents who had a daughter or two daughters in there was called William Flanagan. And William Flanagan was from South Carolina, and he had trouble back there. He drank a lot, he was a drunkard, and he was uh, very hard to get along with. But anyway, he, had, he told George, that, uh, Joseph, that he wants to take out his two girls, and he wants to go back to Wilson, Wilkerson County, Mississippi. George said, you made an oath, you took an oath, a promise, that you leave them in till the end of school in the spring. And I, I, I want me to hold you to that oath. 
Uh, Flanagan was furious, but anyway, he kept his, uh, his fury contained for a little bit. A couple of weeks later, he was eating Sunday breakfast at a neighbor's house called Lawrence's. And he was sitting at the, the table there, and he had his gun at the door. All this is in Spanish West Florida Archives, Volume 8 and 9. You get the whole story. I'm not making this up. <laughs> but anyway, uh, George Sharp come, uh, Joseph Sharp comes to the door. He's a younger brother of George. George went, went back up to Kentucky. Comes to the door and to visit the Lawrences, and he, he sees William Flanagan there. Flanagan was in a bad mood. He gets up from the table, grabs his gun by the door, and goes out. Sharp starts talking with the Lawrences. Flanagan went around the cabin, came up to the back side of Sharp, and shot him in the back. Sharp fell down. This is all in, in the Spanish West Florida archive. Fell down, dying, bleeding. He says, I loan him the powder and the ball, and he shoots me with it. <laughs> but uh, before he says, someone take care of my family. He had three children that we know of. He had Joseph Jr., who's going to wind up in Mandeville. He had James. And he also had uh, a daughter, Patsy. And his wife, Elizabeth. 